so today's Bible study is, is really interesting. Um, and uh, we're still in this fourth chapter of Galatians. Uh, and I'll, I'll say, uh, my aunt asked, you know, should I wait until you guys start another chapter uh, before I jump in? And I said, no. I said, you can really jump into these Bible studies anytime. Because with Galatians, it's always, I think, helpful to remember that there is a very central message to Galatians. So that even if Paul kind of dances here or there and, and addressing different issues, it's always about justification by faith in Christ uh, apart from the law. Uh, and, and Paul is always uh, trying to, to, to lift up the, 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 the salvation that we have through faith in Christ um, and, and against these opponents uh, who have crept into the Galatian congregation and led them astray. Uh, and so there's always this central teaching. And so really uh, all of us can, you know, we can jump into Galatians at any time if we keep that in mind, you know, that the, the, our central teaching of justification uh, is at the heart of what Paul is, is writing here to the Galatians. Uh, and so now Paul, um, in this fourth chapter, we're in Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 21, uh, Paul is going to use an analogy, uh, and uh, it's using uh, the, the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, he's going to use all of these characters from Genesis uh, as an analogy for what he's trying to say to the Galatians. And I think it's good to recognize that this is an analogy uh, because analogies can be difficult, uh, complicated. Sometimes you sort of, you hear someone using analogy and you're not quite sure what they're saying. Um, but it's, again, it's good to remember there is a central teaching here. We've heard this already in Galatians, uh, this, this central t message of justification, uh, which will help us understand what Paul is, is saying now by referring back to these, these characters from the Old Testament. Um, so then verse 21, Paul says, Tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? Um, so again, uh, Paul is, is writing to these Galatians who have been duped. Uh, they have been misled uh, by false apostles uh, who want to introduce the law uh, into the, the calculus of salvation. Uh, these, these false preachers want to say, yes, yeah, Jesus is good, but we, we need that we can't forget Moses. Uh, these, te these false teachers are saying, yes, uh, faith is a good start, uh, but you should probably also maybe try circumcision as well uh, and, um, and keep these old Jewish feasts. You don't want to let go of that. Uh, and so the, these teachers, these false teachers, have tried to say, yeah, Christ is good, but you also really need the law if salvation is going to be effective. Uh, and so Paul is writing to these people saying, okay, if you want to be subject to the law like that, he says, then how about you listen to the law? And now Paul here is making um, a play on words uh, because you see here that the word law uh, appears twice in his question. Okay, you want to be subject to the law. Well, then you should listen to the law. And here's the play on words is that the word law can refer to uh, the, the laws, the commandments uh, given to us by Moses and so forth. Uh, but the law is also uh, sort of the nickname for the first few books of the Bible. Uh, you may remember that the, the first five books of the, of the Bible, uh, they go by a few different names. Uh, one of the names is, uh, it's called the Pentateuch. Uh, that's uh, one of the phrases we use, those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, known as the Pentateuch, which means the, just the first five books. Uh, they're also called the books of Moses. Uh, Jesus refers to uh, these books of the Bible as uh, the books of Moses. Uh, the writings of Moses. Um, uh, but another name for that um, is uh, the Torah. Uh, that was the old, the old Hebrew uh, word for these books of the Bible, the Torah. Uh, and the word Torah really can be translated in a number of different ways. Uh, the way it's most commonly translated as is, is the law. Uh, so in, when people talk about the, the writings of the Torah, they'll sometimes just kind of translate that into simple English as the writings of the law. Uh, but that is a really, it, it's an, I th I'd say that's a rather un, a unfortunate um, uh, simplification of what those first five books are. Uh, because certainly uh, we get Moses, uh, he figures prominently in those first five books. And Moses certainly did uh, teach the law to Israel. 
Uh, but those first five books of the Bible are not just law, uh, the way we understand law versus gospel. Uh, because in those first five books, uh, we certainly get much uh, wonderful preaching of the gospel, uh, of uh, God promising us salvation through his son. Uh, and so, uh, but, but Paul is using this little play on words here, saying, okay, we call those first five books the Torah or the law. So if you all want to be subject to the law, well, then let's listen to the law. Uh, let's listen to what Moses says in the Torah. And so now he's going to go back to Genesis in the Torah, in the law, uh, to find this great analogy of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar uh, to describe uh, the, life of, uh, the life in faith versus the life under the law. And so now in verse 22 he says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. All right, now he's referring again back to Genesis. Uh, this you could, you know, in, in fact, you may as well, uh, you, you might want to just keep, keep a finger here in Galatians here because we should look back at uh, Genesis. May as well turn back to the first book of the Bible. Let's just do that right now. Turn back to Genesis and you can look, we, let's go to Genesis 15. All right, I think that Genesis 15 is a good place to, to start here. Uh, because Paul's referring now to these events uh, about Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. Uh, and when we look at Genesis 15, you know, we find that this is uh, back when Abraham wasn't even Abraham. He had a different name. You remember uh, before he was Abraham, God uh, renamed him, but he was originally Abram uh, before changing his name. And this is one of those places where God promises Abraham a son. Uh, this was not the first time God made this promise to Abraham, uh, but uh, this is one of the big moments when God will, uh, will, will reassure Abraham, yes, I will give you a son. So in, in Genesis 15, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. All right, now, we don't know who Eliezer is. All of the, uh, what we do know is that this is a slave, a servant in Abram's house. And because he has no son uh, at this point, if he were to die that day, all of his property would get passed on to this Mr. Eliezer. Okay, that's Abram's point. He doesn't have a son at this point. So verse 3, Abram said, You have given me no offspring. And so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. No one but your very own issue shall be your heir, your own child. And verse 5, famous moment here in the Bible. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants, or I think we all remember this, the word in Hebrew is seed. Uh, so shall your descendants, or so shall your seed be and Abram believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Uh, so God reassures Abram he's going to keep that promise. He promised him a son and he'll he'll follow through on it. He'll deliver what he's promised. Um, but now in, in 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 chapter 16 in Genesis, you know, this is when Abram is still impatient. Okay, now this is important for us to remember is that God gives us important and big promises. Uh, but he also tests our faith and asks us to be patient as we wait for the fulfillment of those promises. Uh, so patience is part of faith. Uh, trusting that even though we don't see at the moment exactly how God is going to provide for us, uh, nevertheless trusting that he will. Uh, so this is what Abram is going through. Is this, uh, he, is, he is suffering uh, through faith and suffering through the patience uh, that is required of faith. And so now, chapter 16 in Genesis, Sarai, also the Sarah, who now still has her old name, Sarai, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave girl, 
and gave her to her husband Abram as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. All right, so Hagar looks down on Sarah. You know, you know, too bad for you. I'm the one who has the child. You know, um, this is this is there's some contention brewing uh, in the household. Uh, well, no wonder. I mean, boy, you could just see it coming from a mile away. You know, once Abram and Sarah uh, lose patience, and once they think that they they can help God along by having Abram sleep with the you know the the servant girl, you know, there's there's going to be trouble brewing. You know. Um, and, and so, yeah, Hagar looks down on Sarah. Ha, I'm the one who has the child, you know. Uh, your husband's going to start you know, thinking highly of me now. I'm going to be his favorite. So she looks with contempt on her mistress. Hagar looks down on Sarah. Verse 5, then, Hera, then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong be done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. All right, now it's going to continue, that, that saga of Abram and Sarah and Hagar. Uh, but let's go back to Galatians now, uh, in the, the fourth chapter of Galatians. Uh, where Paul, again, is using this as an allegory, an analogy, uh, to help us uh, understand uh, the difference between uh, justification under faith versus justification by the law. And so now in, in chapter 4, back to Galatians, chapter 4, verse 23, Paul says, uh, one, uh, one of these children, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other... The child of the free woman was born through the promise. All right, now, um, uh, the name, what was the name of the child born of the promise? What was his name? Uh, that was, yeah, that was Isaac. Um, and, uh, and he was promised to Abram and Sarah. Uh, and in fact, uh, and, and this is important, not only was um, Isaac promised to Abram, uh, but also, uh, if you look at chapter, uh, if go back to Genesis now, like I said, we're going to have to do a little bit of flipping back and forth here. So keep your finger or put a pencil in these different pages. If you go back to Genesis 17, all right, that, next, that very next chapter uh, where we are just looking, in Genesis 17, verse 19, um, uh, you, or actually you could say even Genesis 17, verse 18, uh, Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. Uh, Abraham is saying, Please, let, I have got a son, just so God, how about you just count this as the fulfillment of the promise? But no, verse 19, God said, No, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Uh, so God is explicit with Abraham. This child will be born of Sarah. Uh, so again, God is saying to Abraham, be patient. Uh, again, patience is part of faith. Uh, and so uh, Abraham uh, does not get to decide how God will keep his promise. Uh, and God says the child will be born of Abraham and Sarah. And so again, back to Galatians now uh, at verse 23. Uh, one of these children... Uh, the child of the slave, that's Ishmael, uh, was born according to the flesh. Now, you know, th that is the way all of us were born. <laughs> all of us were born from our parents uh, by natural unions of husband and wife uh, and their marital relations. Um, but the other, uh, the child of the free woman, that is Isaac, uh, was born through the promise. Uh, God promised Abraham and Sarah. And though, and though Isaac was born of natural marital relations, uh, of the, the sexual relations of husband and wife between Abraham and Sarah, this was very much the child of the promise uh, because uh, Abraham and Sarah, they were past uh, their childbearing years. Uh, you know, uh, Sarah had been through menopause. Uh, Sarah was no longer, uh, no longer uh, at an age where she would naturally have children. Uh, so this was very much God making sure we all know that this happened only because of a promise. Only because of God promised this did it happen. Uh, and so now uh, Paul is going to is sort of creating these two categories. Mentally here, we can think, you know, again, uh, Isaac, Ishmael. Under Isaac uh, goes promise. 
under Ishmael goes flesh. And now he's going to continue developing and sort of adding bullet points here. Again, Isaac, Ishmael. Isaac is, is, is uh, promise. Ishmael is flesh. Uh, and then so in verse 24, back to Galatians now. Galatians chapter 4, verse 24, Paul says, Now this is an allegory. These women, uh, Sarah and Hagar, are two covenants, or you might say two promises, uh, two testaments. Um, one woman, in fact, is Hagar, that's the, the slave, Abraham's slave, from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Okay, so now uh, Paul is going to develop this category over here, the category of Ishmael. Again, Ishmael, flesh, born of Hagar, from Mount Sinai, and slavery. This is all part of what it means to be living under the law like Ishmael. And, and Paul develops this further in verse 25. He says, Hagar, that is Ishmael's mom, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Okay, we need to unpack this a little bit. Paul is kind of in a rapid fire mode here, just throwing out a lot of information. Um, uh, but he compares Hagar to Mount Sinai. Uh, now, Luther does make a comment here uh, when, he, when, he's, uh, when he's teaching on Galatians. Uh, Luther makes a comment uh, that, uh, that Hagar, uh, it was actually the name uh, given to Mount Sinai by the Arabs. Uh, now, I am not a student of Arabic, uh, but I know Luther was referring uh, to uh, some of the ancient teachers here. Uh, and saying that, you know, a different, um, you know, different uh, people have different names for things. You know, what, uh, what, we call, what we call a drinking fountain, those crazy people in Wisconsin call a bubbler, you know. What we call uh, French fries, the British call chips, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, what Paul is saying is that, um, that what the Jews called Mount Sinai, you know, where Moses got the Ten Commandments, the Arabs had a different name for that mountain. And they called that mountain Hagar. All right. Now again, I don't know the long history here of the Arabs and how they and their their names for uh, for that mountain. But this is this is Paul's point: is that uh, the Arabs had their own name for Mount Sinai, and again they called it Hagar. And so so Paul here is drawing is drawing a connection here to say that again Mount Sinai is the, the the location where Moses got the tablets of stone. That's where Moses got the commandments. So, so the Mount Sinai is associated with the law. And so now Paul is saying we, that, that, that Hagar is also associated with the law. Uh, because Hagar is the name of that mountain where Moses got the law, you know, in Arabic. Um, that uh, that uh, Hagar, we can also sort of make a mental connection here uh, between Hagar and the law. So that the things that happened to, to Ishmael, you know, uh, Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. Um, this was the child of the flesh. Uh, this, this is what it means to live under the law. This is what it means to try to run back to Moses for your salvation. To try to go back to circumcision and say that circumcision is what will really define your relationship with God. That by keeping the law, somehow by keeping the law, you can make yourself closer to God, make yourself righteous. Uh, Paul is saying, sorry, but that is living under Moses. It's living under, uh, trying to live on Mount Sinai. It's trying to live under the law, you know, there with Hagar, you know, again, whose name uh, is, is shared with that mountain of the law. And Paul says that this woman bears children for slavery. Uh, that's, that's the end uh, of verse 24, that Hagar bears children for slavery. Uh, because again, um, uh, Hagar is the slave woman in the house. You know, Abraham and Sarah, they were, the, they, were, they were husband and wife. Hagar was their slave woman. And, and now we should remember, uh, I'm having you turn back and forth between um, uh, Genesis and Galatians, so I won't make you turn again. Uh, but just let me read this verse now. You know, you can make a mental note or even write this down. This is a very key verse um, from John chapter 8, from the Gospels. Uh, and you may recall that over the summer, we spent a lot of weeks on Sunday morning. Uh, in our worship services with, uh, with John chapter 8. That, that it began with Jesus feeding the thousands with loaves and fish, and then it got into this extended conversation about Jesus as the bread of life. 
And, and the Jews did not like hearing Jesus talk like this uh, because uh, they thought um, that they had a connection to God through the law. And here comes Jesus saying, nope, uh, your connection to God is not through the law, but through me, uh, the bread of life. And so it was in John chapter 8 where Jesus says this. Again, you don't have to turn to it, but you can make a mental note. It's John chapter 8, beginning at verse 34. Uh, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Uh, so here is a key thing that Jesus teaches us about the difference between slaves and children is that slaves don't have a permanent place in the household. Uh, if you're a slave or a servant or if you're an employee, you can be fired, you can be let go, uh, whereas a child will always have a place there. We can even think of the prodigal son uh, who, who left home, wasted everything that he had, was a terrible son. But when he came home, uh, his father ran to him, embraced him, and welcomed him back. That's a son. You know, if, if that had just been a slave, he might have been dismissed. You've, 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 been a, a, you've embarrassed our household. You've squandered everything I gave you. Sorry. Uh, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. You know, that, that would be how the father might have treated a slave. But it's a son, and he cannot let go of his son. That's, that son always has a place there. In fact, that's one of the ironies of the prodigal son, is that the son uh, doesn't understand grace. That son does not understand <laughs> how, how love works. And so when he's sitting there in the pig slop, remember, he says, well, I'm going to go back home, and I'm going to just ask my dad if he'll treat me as a hired servant. Just take me back as a slave, is what the son thinks. I don't deserve to be a son, so maybe I can just get you know, a job working for my old man. Uh, the son does not understand the love of his father. <laughs> Uh, because this, the father will not take him back as a slave. The father will, will take him back as a beloved son. Uh, and so this is Jesus' point. He says, um, slaves can come and go, but a son always has a place there. And so now Paul is really picking up on that theme to say, uh, Hagar, Ishmael, that's the child of slavery. It's the child of the law, the child of flesh. Uh, and, and so the only thing that uh, the law could ever do for us is make us slaves. Uh, Moses uh, will always have commands, do this, don't do that. But Moses cannot give you certainty that you belong. Uh, if you only have an ear for the law, if you're only listening to commands, do this, don't do that, you will never have any certainty that you belong. Uh, you can, it'll, the, the, your, the law will always be in your conscience saying, did you really do enough? Uh, I think you really screwed up, uh, and you've probably lost your place. I mean, this is that son, the prodigal son, sitting in the pig slop thinking, oh boy, maybe if I'm lucky my dad will take me back and just, you know, pay me to work for him. You know, that, that's, that's the voice of the law. Again, no certainty. Uh, there's no confidence that you really have a place with God. Uh, and so Paul says, again, to the Galatians at the end of verse 24 there, uh, this is bearing children for slavery. Uh, this, this, is, this is Hagar and Ishmael. Boy, we could get kicked out at any time. There's, there's no certainty with that. Moses cannot give you confidence. He can give you rules. Uh, and for a time, you know, you know uh, there is a kind of self-delusion about the law. There is a way where you can feel kind of smug and think, I'm doing pretty well at keeping the law. I'm a pretty good person. But it doesn't last. Uh, it doesn't last. Uh, because as soon as you screw up, and life has a way of doing that to us, we, we can be pretty good and smug for a while. Uh, but then we have a way of stumbling and ending up right back in despair. Uh, so uh, th this is a life of slavery. It is not a life of certainty. And so then, again, Galatians chapter 4, in verse 25, uh, Paul really kind of spells it out. Hagar, we've, you know, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. All right, so now uh, Paul even compares uh, Hagar 
Mount Sinai uh, to the present Jerusalem. Now, uh, Mount Sinai is, is nowhere near Jerusalem. These are not the same mountains. I mean, Jerusalem is also a hill. Jerusalem is built on a hill. Uh, but now Paul is kind of making a comparison. These are two different mountains, but they're very similar to each other, he says, um, because uh, she is in slavery with her children. Uh, now, uh, Jerusalem is a very, it's a complicated city uh, because in the Bible, Jerusalem, it's the, the home or it's the royal city of David. Uh, it's, it's very important. That is where Christ was crucified, just outside of Jerusalem. Uh, it's also the city where the disciples, they were told uh, to go and wait uh, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so it is in Jerusalem after Christ has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven. Uh, it's in Jerusalem where the disciples are waiting and the Holy Spirit comes upon them at Pentecost. Tongues of fire speaking in tongues. They pre preach the gospel. Uh, so Jerusalem, of course, is a very important city. Um, but uh, here what Paul is referring to is, uh, is the, the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament of Jerusalem. That is, Jerusalem is where uh, it's where the temple was, the Old Testament sacrificing, sacrifices of animals, uh, the Old Testament priesthood. Uh, and so Paul is using Jerusalem in this case as sort of a, 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 sort of a, a symbol of the law. Uh, because this is, this is where, um, uh, where, where the, the sacrifices and the priesthood all took place. Uh, and so he's saying, you know, Mount Sinai, you know, again, Moses, is sort of, in, is sort of synonymous with Jerusalem. Uh, and, and here we could also think about Jesus, uh, you know, really lamenting uh, or just kind of wringing his hands over Jerusalem. And this was, uh, if you want to write it down, you don't have to turn to it, but it's, it's Matthew chapter 23, uh, where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem at the end of Matthew 23, uh, beginning at verse 37. Uh, so again, Matthew 23, 37, where Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, so this is Jesus. He is, he is uh, sorrowful over Jerusalem, the holy city that has, you know, it's a holy city because that's where the, uh, the, the priests are, the sacrifices, the temple. But nonetheless, it's the city that keeps on stoning prophets. The, the people of Jerusalem and the, and the royalty of Jerusalem do not want to hear what God has to say to them. Uh, and so it, it is the city that will reject Christ and put him on a cross. Uh, and Jesus says, your house is left to you desolate. I mean, this is a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, so here, when, when Paul refers to Jerusalem, uh, we're not thinking here so much of the city where uh, the gospel was first preached or where the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. We're thinking here of the Jerusalem uh, that, was so, uh, that was so bound to the law, uh, the city that was so bound uh, to the Old Testament, uh, to to the temple and sacrifices and the old priesthood that, the, that the, these people could not receive Christ when he came to them. Uh, and so um, uh, this, this is, again, the life under the law, and it does not have a happy ending. Uh, again, Jesus already is, is, is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, so this life under the law does not have a happy ending. If we bind ourselves to Moses, if we think we are going to, uh, we're going to get closer to God uh, by following the law, it has a very sad ending. Um, it, is, it is nothing less than the rejection of Christ. Uh, to try to pursue your salvation through the law, it is a rejection of Christ and it ends in destruction. Uh, so again, uh, Paul is tying all of these things together. Hagar, Mount Sinai, and Moses. Uh, the, the Old Testament priesthood in Jerusalem slavery. Uh, th this, is, this is what that, that life is. It's slavery. But then in verse 26 now, Paul is going to return to this other column. Okay, he's been talking about Hagar, Ishmael, the law. Now he returns to column A, <laughs> Isaac, Sarah, uh, verse 26. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. All right, Sarah, uh, is our mother. Uh, she is the wife of the promise. 
Again, God told Abraham explicitly, no, 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 the, the, the child that I'm talking about, God says, will be born of Sarah, your wife, not, not the slave, but Sarah, your beloved wife. Uh, and Paul says she corresponds to the Jerusalem above. Okay, the Bible will often make this distinction. There are two Jerusalems. Uh, the old Jerusalem is actually just sort of a, a foretaste of the feast to come, as we say. The, the, the old Jerusalem uh, in, in this old world is simply a picture for us of the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, where it's not going to be David sitting on the throne, but David's son, Jesus. Um, and so uh, th this heavenly Jerusalem, Paul says, uh, uh, she is free and she is our mother. All right, now when, when he says free, again, that's that distinction between slavery and freedom. Again, the slave does not have a permanent place in the household, but the son has a place there forever. That's what it means that she is free. Uh, she will not be kicked out of the house. Uh, she is free. She has a place there. And she is our mother. Uh, Sarah is our mother by faith. Uh, the, the gospel has many children. We are children of the gospel. We are children of Sarah. Uh, just, as we are, uh, just as we sing, Father Abraham has many children, uh, has many sons, and I am one of them. Uh, we could also sing that Sarah has many sons, and I am one of them. Uh, because we, we share the faith of Sarah. Uh, now again, this was one of the, the controversies that came up in the gospels. Uh, where people would say, um, they say, we are children of Abraham. Uh, don't tell me, Jesus, uh, about, uh, you know, <laughs> don't, don't tell me that I don't belong to God. I, I'm a child of Abraham. And, and Jesus says, no, no, no. Uh, if God wants to raise up children from, uh, to Abraham, he could do, make children of Abraham from these stones, uh, Jesus says. Um, God can make children where and when he wants to. And he says, by faith, we are Abraham and Sarah's children. And again, we are, and, and, and we're not children by Hagar. We're not, this, this child, this, uh, this, this, uh, this wonderful status as children of God, it does not come through the law. Uh, it, it, is, it, comes through, it comes through faith. Uh, the way it did for Abraham and Sarah when they trusted in God. And I, I know there, many times they gave up that trust, uh, but they did believe in the promise. And God counted it to them as righteous. They believed that God would make good on his word. And God did make good on, on his word, giving them Isaac. Uh, so she is our mother, uh, for it is written. Uh, now this is referring to Isaiah. Uh, now you're going to get a quotation here from Isaiah 54, verse 1, if you're keeping track. Uh, for it is written, Rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children. Uh, burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. All right. Um, so again, th this is a song uh, from Isaiah that Paul is quoting. Uh, and it applies uh, to all of us uh, that we are children of the promise. Uh, and that God is telling us also to rejoice uh, because he will have many children from this promise. Now, it's, it's one of the recurring themes in the Bible, one of the recurring stories that happens actually multiple times uh, where we have uh, women in the Bible uh, who, are, uh, who agonize over the fact that they cannot have children. Uh, this, this was the case uh, for Sarah, uh, the one we've been talking about today, that for many years she was childless. Uh, you could think of some other characters as well. Um, you know, the, John the Baptist, his parents, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, for many years they uh, were not able to have children until in their old age also uh, God gave them a son. Uh, it also it happens in the Old Testament. I uh, remember uh, Samuel, his mother. That was actually the story I did last week for story time uh, was the, the story of, of, of Hannah. That was Samuel's mom. Uh, you remember uh, that uh, Hannah uh, was married to Elkanah, who had two wives. Uh, there was uh, Hannah and then Penina. All right, Hannah and Penina. Uh, Penina had children. Hannah did not. Uh, and, uh, and Penina made fun of Hannah for that. Penina made Hannah's life difficult. She, she made fun of her because Hannah could not have children. Uh, and, and Hannah prayed for children. And finally, God answered that prayer, and her child, her first child, was little baby Samuel, uh, who grew up to be a great prophet, one of the great prophets uh, of Israel. Uh, and so this is this theme in the Bible, uh, the, the, the difficulty 
uh, of, of, for many women who cannot have children, um, and, and how God promises, this promise from Isaiah, Rejoice, O childless one, you who bear no children. Burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Uh, now, there are a number of ways that I think we can hear this, uh, a number of ways. Um, that Again, this is, this is a, a word of reassurance uh, for husbands and wives who struggle uh, with uh, conceiving children. Um, and I, um, I, I think here, I always think of a, a dear friend of mine um, at, uh, when I went to college. Uh, there was a, a, a lovely couple, an older couple. They, they put a lot of hours volunteering at the chapel. Uh, he was a professor uh, where I went to college. Uh, she worked in the financial aid office. Um, and, uh, and they were not able to have children. Uh, but, uh, you know, m we, many of us students at college, at, at, at Valpo, we became their children. I mean, we were their campus children. And they, they, they showed their love to us. Uh, they uh, prayed for us. They walked with us through our joys and struggles. Um, and, and we looked to them sort of our, as our campus mom and dad. Uh, you know, and so I think that uh, this is a, a word of comfort um, to, to, struggle, to couples who struggle with fertility. Uh, that um, you know that God will give you children. There are many people uh, that you are care that you care for, uh, even if you have no biological children. Uh, many people who are who are part of your family. Uh, but this is also a word of comfort, um, uh, and and we can see how this this was fulfilled in in some very concrete ways in the Bible. Again, whether it was Zechariah and Elizabeth or Hannah um, or some of these other women. But this is also a word of comfort for uh, us as a church. Um, that, uh, that the church will continue to have children uh, and that it can often look to us as a church uh, as if there, are, there will be no children. You know, that we worry about attendance is going down or offerings aren't as high as we wish they would be and we can sort of even look at other uh, churches or, or other organizations in this world that seem to be a lot more popular you know, like there seems like there's always some church elsewhere that has a lot of people, you know, thousands of people showing up each Sunday, and we can get discouraged as a church and feel, and feel childless. You know, we can feel like Hannah or feel like Elizabeth or feel like Sarah, these women in the Bible, and think, oh, they, they're, it's, it's those other people who have children. Here we are childless, uh, barren, desolate. And so there's this word of comfort for us as Christians to say that the gospel will always have children, uh, that God will provide, uh, God will always provide the faithful. Um, you know, you could think of one of those great words, those great verses we heard when we studied 1 Peter. Uh, the word of the Lord will endure forever. Uh, though many things come and go, uh, though, though flowers uh, fade, uh, God's word will always stand. Uh, and so th this, this, is, this is Paul speaking now to the Galatians because, again, uh, these false preachers, they made a really good show uh, with circumcision and all of the, the, the Jewish customs they wanted to reintroduce. They made a very good show, and they made it seem like the, the, the church of Moses uh, was a lot more popular, a lot more attractive, you know, and, and silly Paul, all that he had was just that preaching of the gospel. Boy, not much there. Uh, but Paul, so Paul is saying, look, that the, the false church, uh, the, uh, the, or the, the sort of the, the organizations of this world, whether it's the political parties uh, or kind of sports organizations, or all you can think of, all these things that are so popular in this world. The shopping mall, all these places where people love to go, where the parking lots are full, um, and and, and uh, you know, whereas we just have the gospel, and it, it seems so weak, it seems childless. And so Paul is, is saying to the Galatians and to us, rejoice. Uh, you, you keep preaching the gospel. Uh, and though it seems at times like you have to be patient and wait, and you don't know how God is going to fulfill that promise, he will fulfill the promise. Uh, the gospel will have children. And because, the, and because these children are born of the promise, they are free. Uh, we are not going to have children of slavery. We're not going back to Moses because all Moses can do is create more slaves. All Moses can do is put us under this bondage of the law. We're not going back there. We're not going back to Egypt and living under slavery. We're going to continue with the promise. 
And again, even though it seems like the gospel might be weak, or like last week we heard Paul saying, hey, Paul was admitting that he himself was weak. Look, I'm just this weak preacher. I came to you preaching in weakness. I don't have anything uh, sort of physical or obvious to impress people. All I've got is the gospel. But Paul says we're going to stick with that uh, because that's where true freedom is. The gospel has freedom. The gospel gives us freedom. And the gospel will have children. Um, now, I know we're, we're getting very close to the end of this chapter. Um, but uh, I think we, yeah, we could probably finish this pretty quickly here. And I'll just, because uh, I think really what Paul is doing here is wrapping up things that he's been saying. But so he says, now you, my friends, uh, verse, verse 28, you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. Uh, but just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. Okay, he's referring back to Isaac and Ishmael. And he says that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. Uh, not only did we, we just read that Hagar looked down on Sarah, uh, but Paul says that, uh, that, uh, that Ishmael gave Isaac a hard time. Uh, now, it, it, it's kind of difficult to actually to see the evidence for this in the Bible. That is what Paul specifically is referring to. Uh, we do read back in Genesis 29, if you've still got your finger in it, uh, you, you can go back to Genesis 21. Uh, Genesis 21, uh, actually I'll start at Genesis 21, verse 8, where it says, uh, uh, the child grew and was weaned. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is the birth of Isaac now. So Isaac has been born, the child of the promise. Um, so Isaac, in verse 8, the child grew and was, was weaned. Uh, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son uh, Isaac. Uh, so she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son. Um, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. Now that seems like a kind of a, a moment of, of meanness, cruelty on the part of Sarah. Uh, but what Paul is saying here is that, uh, that, that, that Ishmael was actually persecuting Isaac. Uh, and, now, and there were actually some of the old rabbis uh, who looked at this verse, uh, and, they, and they really made that point. They said that um, one of the ways you, you could interpret this, where it says that Ishmael was playing with Isaac, this was not just a big brother kind of gently playing uh, catch with his little brother, uh, but that this was uh, Ishmael playing so rough with Isaac that Isaac's life was in danger. I mean, that uh, Isaac uh, was really being roughed up uh, by his big brother Ishmael. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what Paul's referring to here, just based on the biblical evidence. Uh, but it does seem among the rabbis, this was kind of the understanding that, that Ishmael was being so rough with Isaac that he was really kind of putting Isaac's life in danger. And, and again, Paul, Paul the rabbi certainly would have been familiar uh, with, those, with those teachings uh, among the rabbis. Um, and so, uh, you know, Paul in verse, back to Galatians, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 29, uh, Paul says that the, the, the child born according to the flesh, that is Ishmael, persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. And I, I guess in some ways you could say, well, regardless of exactly what Paul was referring to in Genesis, the point is clear, is that, the, that, that people who live under the law will persecute those who live by faith. Uh, that is, the, the lovers of the law will look down on, the, on those of us who are justified by faith. Uh, because again, faith looks small. Uh, the preachers of the, of, of the gospel look weak. Um, you know, it, it looks like the, the gospel and the church of, of the gospel look, um, look childless. You know, uh, that the, the, the church parking lot is never as full as the, the shopping mall parking lot. Uh, so, you know, that, that's Paul's point, is that, that um, the law, the people of the law will always persecute and go after um, and look down on the people of the gospel and faith. Uh, but, verse 30, what does the scripture say? Now back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 30. But what does the scripture say? Uh, Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. Uh, so then, friends, we are children, not of the slave, but of the free woman. You know, because this, this is what happened to uh, Abraham and Sarah, is that when Sarah uh, saw this, this rough play or she saw something she didn't like, she was really worried uh, that somehow Ishmael might become, you know, the heir of Abraham's property. Uh, she was upset, and Abraham said, okay, she's your slave. You can drive her out. You can let her go. 
uh, and her son. Um, and so, uh, so Hagar and Ishmael, they have to, they have to leave uh, Abraham's house. Uh, now we know also part of the story is that Abraham, or God still takes care of Hagar and her son. That's part of the story, too. Uh, just like God uh, continues to provide for people who live under the law, I mean, legalists, Pharisees, God still provides for them their daily bread. Um, but uh, unless, uh, if you are going to cling to Moses, what you will not receive is the bread of life. Uh, God will continue to provide for you, care for you. God makes the sun and the rain fall on the, the just and the unjust, uh, but only to those who have faith. Uh, does God give the, the blessings of eternal life? Only those uh, who live by faith receive uh, the forgiveness of sins and the assurance of eternal salvation. Uh, so, so Paul's saying, drive that out. Uh, stop trying to go back to Moses. Uh, Moses is good for many things. <laughs> uh, he is very good at giving us rules and, and kind of uh, good guidance for this life, but Moses cannot uh, give you um, an, an open door to heaven. Only Jesus does that. So, uh, kind of a big chapter, and it kind of goes all over the place here between Galatians and Genesis, but uh, we know we all do love those uh, stories from the Old Testament, and Paul, you know, puts those stories to good use here and really gives us kind of a way of understanding the freedom that we have in Christ. Again, a slave does not have a place in the household. Ishmael gets kicked out, uh, but Christ has a place there forever, uh, and, if, and if Jesus, uh, and this is Jesus' words, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Uh, and Jesus has set you free uh, by his forgiveness. Uh, so, uh, let's just open it up. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions, uh, responses. Uh, how does that strike you? Marn, I know you said that, that uh, this was a, a, a sort of a personal story for you. I mean, I, I, I imagine someone who lived uh, in the Middle East and... Uh, understands, you know, you, you kind of lived firsthand the difference between uh, life with under Isaac or life under Ishmael, uh, um, that you know this, you know the story well. Yeah, and you know, this, this particular passage that we read from Galatians today really very clearly shows the difference between Islam and Christianity. Mm -hmm. yep. Because it's, it's my belief it's my belief that all the world's religions teach the same basic things. They always teach us to be good to each other, to treat others well, you know, to, to give money to the poor, you know, whatever. But there, there's the three religions of Abraham that are, are all based with the same foundation. But where they differ is in... Um, Where they differ is in where they believe that where where I don't know how to say this. Where are they? Where are you going? How are you going to get there? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I believe, like you know, Judaism and Islam both are religions of law, mm -hmm. one hundred percent. Right. right. Um, there's there's no concept of of, of grace or um, you, know, you know just of, of the forgiveness like the way I mean they, they're considered you, you have to forgive other people for doing some you have to be forgiving and you have to forgive other people and you have to ask for forgiveness from people but there's never any discussion about God forgiving us mm -hmm. as human beings because yeah. We're all sinners, and that's mm -hmm. that's the main thing in Islam. Yeah. Everyone is a sinner, and yes, we're, in Christianity, we're all sinners too. But you have to then figure out ways. It's like putting um, uh, coins in the bank so that you can get rid of your sin. Whereas in whereas in Christianity, we have our forgiveness due to the greatest act of of sacrifice ever done. Yeah. And the, it's just such a huge, the, these verses, I, I, I'll, I'll be very honest, I haven't read this, these verses before today. I, I mean, the whole story, the whole concept is something I've thought a lot about. But it's so very clear here that saying those people who follow the line of Ishmael, who don't have the 
um, the idea of, of they, they aren't the sons of the house. They are slaves. And if you can just think about what it's like to constantly be living every single day thinking, I'm a sinner, how am I going to fix that? Yeah. It, it, it's not life. There's, it, there's it's, no confidence. There's no security. No. It's being a slave. It's being a slave to the flesh because, you know, I'm never good enough. I'm never going to amount to anything. Yeah. I'm never going to go to heaven. I'm, never, I'm always going to be a sinner. Whereas we who followed the line of Isaac, which led to Jesus, we don't have that fear. Yeah. We, we still we still have the guilt of sin mm -hmm. because you know we we we, don't, we all want to do good things and to be good, but we don't have that fear of our Father doesn't love us. Yeah. Because we're bad. Right. Now, I, Mara, can I ask? Uh, in in Islam, I mean, uh, how much does Ishmael ever come up uh, among Muslims? Um, oh, it, it's a very very big thing. Yeah. And how do they and actually, how do they regard Ishmael? Well, okay, so it's very interesting because uh, Muslims believe, and I, I was just looking at it online to, mm -hmm. to try and see where, yeah. if it's in the Quran, mm -hmm. but Muslims believe that the son that Abraham was going to sacrifice was Ishmael and mm -hmm. not Isaac. Right. And and um, also, like, I was just reading something here because I wanted to be sure because I thought maybe I would have to, you know, explain it. Um where it says in Genesis that the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, okay, go back to your mistress. You, you know, you can come out here and cry all you want, but you go back to your mistress. Yeah. But in, in the Quran or in Islamic, I can't say in the Quran because I, I don't know it well enough, but in Islamic tradition, they say that um, Hagar left uh because of some kind of altercation between Isaac and and, Is, and Ishmael. Right. But but they say that that's what the Bible says. Yeah. Right. But the Bible doesn't say that. No. Mm -mm. So just even in their confusion or their ignorance, they're saying, "Well, the Bible says this, yeah. but it doesn't." Right. So we're gonna, you know, believe that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. I have I've learned now. There's a lot of that in Islam where the people, the scholars or the people who told the stories and the traditions and whatever, they just went off of, I want to maybe like a uh, rumor. Mm -hmm. I, that's like yeah. the best way I could say it. They right. went off rumor and then they built their, their theology up, up, yeah. up upon that, not upon fact. Right. Yeah, my guess is that Muhammad was probably familiar with also some of these uh, teachings of the rabbis, you know, that, that oh, yeah. aren't really strictly biblical, uh, but sort of the traditions of biblical scholars. Um, and so I, and, and so then, uh, is it fair to say that, that Muslims uh, look up to Ishmael as sort of a grandfather in the faith? Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And and also, um, there's lineage. Prophet, their prophet mm -hmm. Muhammad yeah. is from the line of Ishmael. Ishmael, yeah. Which again yeah. Is, is which is so interesting again just to think that you know what Paul is saying and, and Paul was writing these words many you know centuries before Muhammad or the Quran were ever around uh, yeah. but that Paul is really saying look a life under Ishmael is a life of slavery. Um, yeah. and that, and that Paul really correlates Ishmael to the law and and Muhammad basically just kind of runs with it and says like you bet Ishmael is a life of the law and let's try to keep the law. Yeah. <laughs> I might give you new laws. Me Muhammad might give new laws that are a little different from Moses. A lot like you say a lot of it's the same. Be good to your neighbors and all of that. Um, you know help the poor. But you know it, Muhammad kind of even adds to those laws and then just says good. Now that's how you're gonna get to heaven is by keeping those laws. And so uh -huh. it's really interesting how what Paul was saying even before. Uh, yeah. Muhammad and the Quran. I mean, Paul was sort of anticipating Muhammad here by several centuries. Oh yeah, and I don't. I would love to know at that point in history what they believed because that I think Islam came about about four hundred years mm -hmm. later, three yeah. or four hundred years yeah. later. I, I I would love to learn about that part of history. Like where where was the Arabian people? Where were they going at that time? With their with their religious idea, who who was their god, or where did 
where who did they worship? And I because I know that Abraham they considered to be their father, mm-hmm. so yeah. they did have the um, the Abrahamic philosophy, um, and all of the prophets like uh, Moses and yeah. and and Aaron and and um, Noah, all all of those those are prophets of Islam as yeah. well. But I I don't know what was going on mm-hmm. between the time yeah. of. Jesus and when Islam came into being, which is about three hundred or four hundred years later, yeah. I, that's that would be very interesting. To yeah, and, yeah, and so like you say, there is a great overlap between all the world's religions, that, and and where the overlap happens, and this is I think good for us as Christians to remember, there is a lot of overlap between the world's religions, including with Christianity, and where the overlap happens is in the law, because everybody can agree you should be nice to people, you should be kind, and all of that. But the great division <laughs> is between, um, is between uh, those who believe uh, that we have not kept the law, uh, but that Christ has given us redemption in his blood, uh, and that we receive this redemption by faith alone. Uh, and those who just want to continue with the law and think if they just work harder at it, they can get good enough at the law uh, that they'll, they'll, they'll finally make it. Um, they'll, they'll really, you know, again, open that door of heaven. Um, They'll they'll earn their their way, and so yeah, that this this gospel uh, this gospel of Christ gives us a great assurance, uh, because otherwise you're ba- you're back in that gerbil wheel spinning around, um, thinking I'll try harder next time. Ooh, I screwed up, but I'll I'll do better next time. Uh, whereas Christ just takes you off the wheel and says, nope, <laughs> um, because of what I have done for you. This this is a certainty. Uh, it's it's not sort of a maybe. I'll I'll give you my forgiveness. It is a complete certainty. And so Paul then, in this uh, fourth chapter of Galatians, he, he draws the big corollary, or the, or the, big, uh, the, the big distinction here between freedom and slavery, you know? Um, and, and as Christians, we are free. Uh, we have this confidence in Christ and what he has done for us. I have a question. Yeah. other people. We all believe in the same God. Right. Well, I don't believe that. Yeah, I know. It, it comes from, you know, I don't know how long people have been saying that, uh, but it comes from a desire to try to overcome the world's divisions uh, by finding common ground. You know, and so I, I think there's a, there's a very, you know, uh, uh, it's an understandable, it's, you know, desire to try to get past the, 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 the divisions that cause violence and wars, uh, you know, again, by finding this common ground of saying, we all worship the same God, you know, and so, you know, the Jews, uh, worship, they worship the God who spoke to Moses. Uh, the Muslims worship the God who, you know, spoke to Abraham. We all share these things in common, so really let's stop fighting with each other. Um, now, there, there, you, you can see the truth in that, uh, but again, for us Christians, we say the only God we know is through Jesus Christ. And so I, I know I, I also, I, I can't say um, that Muslims and Jews and Christians, I can't say we all worship the same God because without Jesus, I don't have God. You know, apart from Christ, I mean, boy, Paul is very uh, sharp about the way he puts it. Paul says, apart from Christ, we are godless. You know, he says atheists, which literally means, you know, without God. Um, And so, yeah, I I understand what people are trying to say there and try to find common ground. but I can't really join them in saying it either uh, because you take Jesus out of there and it's not like you just have, you know, two-thirds of God. I mean, that's not how the Trinity works. Um, without Christ, what else do I have? I mean, I, I can't take away Christ and still have the Father and the Holy Spirit or something like that. Again, you take away one, you lose it all. But, yeah, you know, again, you can understand why people try to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Well, why don't we take out our hymnals uh, and uh, gonna sing um, 
number 294. <laughs> Uh, Tim 294, my hope is built on nothing less. Uh, this is Jesus' point, uh, or not, this is, I would say this is Paul's point in speaking about uh, Jesus uh, to the Galatians. Um, this is Paul's point, is that the only hope we have is in Christ. It's not in the law, not in Moses. Um, uh, it's not in Ishmael, or uh, it's, it's, in, it's in Christ. Um, this is the only hope we have. So, uh, Tina, since this is your first time, I'll just say, when we get to this point, I always hit mute. Uh, not because I don't like listening to you all sing, uh, but if you try to sing together over Zoom, uh, the timing gets off, and it's just kind of a mess. So uh, I'll hit mute, but please feel free to sing along. Um, again, it's number 294. And, and the other thing, I, we've also learned that I play this, but it doesn't come through very well on Zoom. Uh, so you might not really even hear this much, but I, I play it nonetheless because I like to kind of get the melody in my head. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. No merit of my own I claim, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood sustain me in the raging flood. When all supports are washed away, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, Clothed in his righteousness alone, Redeemed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, All other ground is sinking sand. Um, I love that hymn, and I, it's really neat, I think, also with this Galatians 4 passage, you know, that, that Paul speaks about Mount Sinai and Mount, or Mount Hagar uh, compared with the old Jerusalem, and uh, to think about all these mountains, even great Mount Sinai can, can just crumble and, and fall to the sea, uh, but Christ is a solid rock. You know, Mount Sinai will one day even, you know, just turn to dust, <laughs> uh, but, but Christ is a rock uh, you can stand on, so just kind of a neat thing that I think we can sing with Galatians 4. So uh, let's, uh, we'll close with our Lord's Prayer. Uh, so let's all fold our hands and, and pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, we'll uh, see you next time. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming.